This is for Systems 1 Pharmacy Technology course. We're looking at our textbook, Chapter 1, History of Medicine and Pharmacy. Medicine has been practiced for thousands of years. Remedies like herbals have been used throughout history. They would also use clay. Before we knew about the germ theory of disease, people thought that um, severe illnesses were caused by evil spirits. They would use herbs and things to treat patients. A lot of the popular beliefs and practices of ancient times have disappeared. One of the things that they used to do is called trephining or trephining. This was um, actually drilling a hole into the skull to give disease or evil spirits a portal through which to leave. They used to have tribal shaman or medicine men in ancient times that were believed to be able to communicate with spirits who they thought would cause those diseases. Here's a picture of, it looks like uh, medieval times, right before the Renaissance, it looks like. There's a lot going on with this picture, and I don't really understand all of it, obviously. Why is there a woman with a book on her head there? And um, why does he have a funnel on his head? So I don't know that, but it's interesting. Um, you can see the, the patient is awake through this because they didn't have anesthesia that they have now. And so they were literally cutting a hole into the skull. We know that they did this because ancient skulls have been found that contain holes. And we also know that they were done um, for a specific purpose because of the way that they're carefully cut out. This person wasn't hit in the, on the head with a club or a spear. Um, this cut was actually made. And it looks like they made a small square and then enlarged it, um, probably with a chisel. We know that patients survived these because the edges of the hole have healed over. Kind of disgusting. Okay, so there are two symbols that we see nowadays that, that are symbols of medicine. One is called the caduceus and one is the rod of Asclepius. So the staff or rod of Asclepius, he was the Greek god of healing. It's a staff or, um, you know, looked like a walking stick without any wings. It has one snake wrapped around it. This is the formal symbol of medicine. This is like the true symbol of medicine and it's used by the World Health Organization and the American Medical Association. The caduceus is the one that we see a lot on medical things. It's very pretty because the wings make it look symmetrical and the two um, snakes are also symmetrical. Um, this is actually the staff of Hermes, who was a Greek god, and he represented magic, so he really, you know, wasn't into medicine. And this is used mistakenly quite often as a symbol of medicine. And there's a picture of a statue of Asclepius and his staff. Okay, um, medicine in its infancy, of course, started uh, back with at least Neanderthal, and we know this because of things that people have found in burial sites, um, but we don't know exactly what they did. They didn't leave recipe books. <clears throat> Plagues used to kill thousands of people all the time, uh, and they didn't know about microbes, so they thought that um, sickness was an entity or caused by evil spirits, and prayer was the most common form of treatment and remains so today in a lot of cultures. And a lot of people who are scientists even still believe in the power of prayer. Hippocrates was a third generation Greek physician. He lived from 460 to 357 BC, and he believed life consisted of a balance of four elements linked to the qualities of good health wet, dry, hot, and cold, and illnesses resulted from an imbalance of the body system's four humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. The four body system humors were also linked to the four basic elements, air, water, fire, and earth, and the way that they would balance these things is purging or um, giving people laxatives, making them vomit, which used an emetic, or bloodletting, because you can't add to these things. You can only take away the one that had too much. So then also to complicate things, yellow bile was uh, connected to fire, but it could be hot or dry. Black bile was connected to earth, it could be dry and cold. And phlegm was connected to water, wet and cold, and blood was connected to air, and it was hot and wet. So um, this, hot and cold and wet and dry thing um, was also associated with this. 
Hippocrates was responsible for a lot of advances in medicine. One of the things he did, one of the reasons we know about him is that he wrote so much. His observations included things like what the patient ate, how that affected them, about the climate, did it rain, was it cold? Um, and so he was one of the first physicians that we know of to record patients' medical illnesses because his writings have survived. Other people may have had writings, but they didn't survive for you know several thousand years. He promoted being kind to sick people, letting them rest, and eating light foods. So, of course, no photographs, but here's a sketch of what people think Hippocrates might have looked like. His writings are called the Corpus Hippocratum. Corpus, of course, refers to the body, so it's a body of work. And he also came up with the Hippocratic Oath, which has a lot of different things in it. But one of the most important parts of it is doctors act only for the good of their patients. So that, you know, you often hear that referred to as first do no harm. And they keep confidential what they learn about their patients. So you don't want to go tell someone that someone else has a particular, you know, disease. And so he's known as the father of medicine in most parts of the world. Here's um, a beautiful statue of Aristotle. We don't know if that's exactly what he'd look like. He was a Greek philosopher and scientist who lived from 384 to 322 BC. He was responsible for a lot of advances, not just in medicine, but also in biology. And he studied and classified various organisms. He described human anatomy from observations after dissecting animals. Um, his studies focused on the brain, heart, lungs, and blood vessels. They did not dissect people in these days for the most part because it was considered against a lot of religious beliefs. In other words, God created this person and we were his highest, most wonderful creation. And so therefore, even though a person had passed away, you don't desecrate the body by trying to look inside of it. So they did not do um, you know, autopsies or dissection of people. Galen, um, is another person that's real famous in medicine. He was a philosopher and he used to say the best physician is always a philosopher. He was a Greek physician, surgeon, and philosopher from 129 to 210 BC. He followed a lot of Hippocrates' beliefs, um, eating a balanced diet, exercise, good hygiene, and he contributed a lot to the study of medicine. And he wrote on things like physiology, anatomy, pathology, study of diseases, diagnosis, and pharmacology, and he's another person who wrote a lot of books who continued to be published, and so we know about him. He proved that blood flowed through arteries, not through the air, because of the pulse at a person's wrist. Roger Bacon was a Franciscan friar. He used to be called Father Bacon, and he was a philosopher and an alchemist. He lived in England from 1214 to 1294. So here we've skipped uh, about a thousand years um, from Galen to Roger Bacon. He refined and explained the importance of the experimental methods, which, you know, experimenting is part of the scientific method. Paracelsus is another person that was, uh, did a lot in medicine. He was a physician and an alchemist. Now, alchemy is then later evolved into chemistry. But at the time, alchemy was kind of considered magic because we didn't know that chemistry or chemical concepts were behind a lot of chemistry at the time. He lived in Switzerland from 1493 to 1541. He believed in treating illnesses with one medication at a time. He produced a lot of non-toxic medications and he kind of came up with laudanum. Laudanum was a popular tonic for de uh, deadening pain. It's a mixture of opium powder and alcohol. It usually contains about 10% opium, which is about the same as 1% morphine. Uh, years later, they processed it, processed it into tincture of opium because it was so bitter in the laudanum form. They used to put a lot of sugar in it to try and get it to not taste so bad. Um, it's used as a cough suppressant and pain reliever. Um, it's now a C2 controlled substance. It's highly addictive, causes severe constipation, and most pharmacies don't stock it. Um, probably the second most common thing that we um, dispense in hospital pharmacy are things for constipation because patients that are on pain medications, most of the heavy duty pain medications cause constipation. So they give them laxatives. 
A lot of ancient herbal remedies uh, have came about throughout the years. The most common ones were mixtures of plants, roots, and other concoctions, including some types of soil and clay. So the common belief was that digesting a type of plant that resembled the diseased organ cured the illness of that organ. They used garlic for inflammation of bronchial tubes, liverwort plant for liver problems, wine and pepper for stomach ailments, onions for worms, and tiger fat for joint pain. In fact, you can get tiger balm ointment now, but it does not contain tiger fat because that would be terrible and against the law. Okay, so here is a picture of some bronchial tubes inside the body, and yes, they kind of do resemble the way that garlic grows. Now, my question was, if they did an autopsy people, what did they know? How did they know what bronchial tubes looked like? I don't know. Maybe they thought this is what a liver looked like and that the liver wart looked like a liver. I don't know. Anyway, um, since people believe that evil spirits cause diseases, uh, a lot of treatments were by trial and error. Um, you know, they just didn't know. Some were effective, some caused death. But for some people, the idea was, well, you need to do something, and the patient will probably die anyway. So anything that they did may or may not have helped, but sometimes they would get the credit for it. So then they came up with new approaches to science, and new methods were devised to test hypotheses, and these produced advances in medicine. In the 18th and 19th century, one of the things that they did to balance the humors was bloodletting, used to uh, lessen excess bodily fluids, which were thought to cause illness. Uh, they also used it as a preventive measure. There's one thing that bloodletting does do, it lowers blood pressure because you don't have as much blood pressing on those arteries. So of course your blood presser, pressure is going to go down. And if your blood pressure is too low, you can die. They would actually cut people's arms at the, at the uh, arm, this part of the arm, or they would cut it at the wrist, and then they would hold a bowl under it and just let it drip blood into the bowl. Um, or they could apply leeches. Leeches contain, their saliva is a, it contains a substance called herudin, which is a natural anticoagulant. George Washington died partly due to excessive blood loss because he had several physicians and they all wanted to help, so they would um, perform bloodletting. And over the period of just a couple of weeks, they removed a huge amount of blood and he passed away. So I don't know if we'll ever know if he would have survived his illness, his last illness, if it weren't for his doctors. I don't know. Um, venesection, accessing a vein to remove blood, was common until the early 1900s. Medical leeches are now making a comeback. Here's a picture of leeches that are used in medicine. Apparently, uh, they're quite popular in Russian medicine, according to the website I got this picture from. Um, but we use them now uh, in some cases. Let's say that someone's finger uh, gets cut off. And, you know, if you find someone's finger that's been hacked off somehow, you can put it in a plastic baggie and take it and put it on ice and take it with you to the hospital and they can reattach it. However, when they reattach large veins, they don't always manage to reattach the fine little micro veins that are, you know, returning blood to the heart. So the blood through the larger veins gets to the finger, but then those little tiny micro veins aren't necessarily reattached and it takes, you know, weeks sometimes for those to sort of reattach themselves. And so the patient's finger or other attached body part will swell up with blood, which doesn't carry oxygen and will actually start to decay. And then that's really bad. So they use leeches to the diseased body part, it could be a toe or a finger, and the leeches will draw off the blood that comes into the finger um, from the heart so that it doesn't have to go back to the heart right away and fresh blood can come in. So that's what uh, they're being used for here in the U.S. right now. And that's right now, as far as I know, that's their only um, real use. In the 18th and 19th century, a lot of medical schools, a few, opened in America. The first one in the United States opened in 1765 at the College of Philadelphia. Um, it, they, it was opened by John Morgan and William Shippen Jr. at what later became the University of Pennsylvania. They have a really good, you know, maybe I don't know if it's this one. Uh, I think it is though. They have a really good uh, museum of pharmacy. 
in the 18th and 19th century, also religious leaders became very active in researching medicinal remedies to treat the sick. So here's Gregor Mendel. Mendel was uh, a monk and a scientist in Austria, and he was studying pea plants and he observed and determined the transfer of traits between the generations of pea plants. And because of that, he's known as the father of genetics. So here's one, some of the things that he experimented on. They had pea plants with purple flowers and pea plants with white flowers. And apparently the white flower was a recessive trait. So then here's what happens when you mix them together. And you've all heard of Florence Nightingale. She was an Italian nurse. She spent her career caring for the wounded. She believed in cleanliness. She started, uh, I was reading recently that she didn't really want to start a school for nurses, but the school was formed anyway. And so she had to like take credit for it. It was interesting. But she wrote a lot about healthcare reform and also record keeping. Like a lot of times um, when she started at the, uh, during the Crimean War, she went in um, and was helping care for the wounded and she realized that they didn't have just one book listing deaths of the soldiers. Um, they had like four different books and some soldiers would be mentioned twice and some soldiers would forget to, they would forget to write it down. So that was really sloppy record keeping. And reading about her life story, she kind of reminds me of someone with a little bit of OCD, like you have to write it down. And nowadays, of course, nurses are taught um, that they have to document everything. And that's always a good practice because otherwise you don't know why something happened if you didn't document it. So here's an interesting article I found about her. It's not an assignment, but here's a picture of her during the Victorian age with, she looks a little bit like Queen Victoria there. If you wanna read it, there's the link to it. In North America, in early America, when people would immigrate over here, they would bring the diseases with them from other parts of the world. Doctors in those days were responsible for diagnosing conditions, but also preparing the remedies to cure the patients. The word apothecary ended up becoming druggist, and the first druggists were doctors. And um, druggist was a term used for people who were preparing pharmaceuticals. Some of the things that they used in early America, they would use quinine from the cinchona bark, and they used it for malaria. They used mercury to cure syphilis. It was very toxic, caused a lot of deaths. Some people actually survived uh, the mercury cure and uh, ended up surviving syphilis, but it was rare. The average life expectancy of early colonial people was only 40 years. If a person hit the age of 60, they were considered quite elderly indeed. Um, we didn't have vaccines for childhood diseases, so people would die of diphtheria, smallpox, roseola, um, chickenpox even, uh, polio, um, whooping cough, which is pertussis. So uh, in 19, sorry, 1796, uh, a man named Jenner developed a, uh, they called it variolation for smallpox. He noticed that um, in the town in England that he lived in, um, he noticed that women who worked with cows, the milkmaids, they would not get smallpox but they would come into contact with cows who had cowpox. And so he was trying to figure out in the town he was in who had smallpox and who didn't. And then he noticed the thing with the cows. So he decided that if someone was exposed to cowpox, they would not get smallpox. And he didn't know why, because again, even though microscopes were invented in the 15 and 1600s, they weren't using them to diagnose diseases yet. So he came up with this cowpox variolation. He would actually just take a scab of someone's sore or a scab from the cow and break it into pieces. And then he would cut someone and attach the piece and sort of rub it in. And then you would get that in your bloodstream. But he really didn't know exactly what he was doing because of course they didn't know about um, bacteria and viruses and other types of germs. So they were doing this this whole time. Um, 
there's so, so, so much history there and it's all swirling around in my head and it's so fascinating. I could just be a medical historian. Um, but anyway, in 1971, they finally eradicated smallpox throughout the world. Um, I have a smallpox scar on my arm, which everybody over 50 has because, at least in the U.S., because um, I remember being in kindergarten or first grade and marching through the nurse's office and we all got our injections and they were given with sort of an air gun, which was kind of interesting. It wasn't necessarily a needle, um, but it, did, it used several very tiny needles and so we all have this round scar. So anyway, smallpox remains the only nation or the only worldwide disease that has been eradicated. Little bits of it, little pieces of these um, poxes are at the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. And there's one in um, the Russian Centers for Disease Control, whatever they call theirs. However, some have gone missing. So that raises, you know, an interesting possibility. Like what happened to them? It's a mystery. Okay, so for most patients um, or most families, they would hand down their own little family recipes for different things. People would have uh, a really bad head cold and someone would mix them up a tea that contained different herbs and roots and things like that, usually containing a little alcohol as well. And so they would be told to drink that twice a day. And whether it actually helped or not, I don't know. I do know you can go into herbal shops and you can purchase things for sinus. And most of those will contain things like mint, um, which helps open up sinuses and things. They don't taste good to me. I've tried. <laughs> okay, uh, laudanum, going back to laudanum, which is opium and alcohol, that was the most popular tonic for medic medicinal use, especially during the Revolutionary War and the Civil, Civil War. Um, then later, even into the 1800s and early 1900s, um, they would call it mother's little helper and women would buy it for their household apothecary use. Um, however, um, they would become addicted to it. And the problem with laudanum was not just its terrible taste, but it had a really, really bad rebound effect. So if you took laudanum for say a headache and you went to bed because it makes you very sleepy, you would wake up with a severe headache and then how do you get rid of that headache? More laudanum. So that uh, reinforced the addictive process and it was very dangerous. When we get into chapter two, we're gonna talk about the Opium Convention of 1912 and 1914 right in there. And we'll talk about why they decided to actually um, regulate um, opium. Absinthe, uh, comes from the wormwood plant. Um, they would mix the wormwood um, plant with alcohol. It, I've heard that it tastes a little bit like licorice. I haven't tried that one. And it's kind of green. And it's a treatment, they use it as a treatment for tapeworms, but it was also just a very popular drink. And in the 1920s during prohibition, you know, if you were to go to a speakeasy and order, order alcohol, you were being very daring. And if you ordered absinthe, you were being even more daring. In really, really high doses, wormwood can cause hallucinations. So people then decided to ban it because, you know, it causes hallucinations. And so it was banned um, for about 80 years. And then I believe in 2012, they allowed it to be um, produced and sold again in the US because you'd have to take really high doses to have those hallucinations and not everybody gets them. It has a very, very bitter taste. So it was really popular to have your glass and have a spoon on top of it with holes in it and you'd put a sugar cube on top of the spoon and then pour the absinthe over the sugar which would melt down inside the spoon. I mean, in the spoon and then drip down into the drink. So it was a whole little thing like, uh, you know, it was almost as popular as like a martini mixer was to prepare this drink. Okay, uh, the origin of opium and opiates. Opium is a byproduct of Papaver somniferum, which is the opium poppy. It's grown in Afghanistan and a lot of other countries. Uh, right now, opium and opi opiates, which are plants that are derived from opium, um, so they have to have the, the plant, this uh, byproduct, in order to make something that's an opiate. 
if it's an opioid, so I think of the word android as an artificial man, opioid is sort of an artificial opiate. It's made in a laboratory from other things that they combine to make the same chemical structure. So the term um, is synthetic opioid or semi-synthetic, that's the more correct term. They act on the same receptor sites in the nervous system and the GI tract and they have the same side effects. All opioids and opiates are controlled substances in the US. Here's the flower that they come from. One of them, there's a few different varieties. And they have this, um, the, it's almost like a rose hip at the end. And if you cut it, you'll get the uh, rosin from it. It's a black tar-like substance and that's actually where they get uh, black tar heroin from. So some currently used opiates and opioids, we have oxycodone, which is oxycontin, hydrocodone, which is in Vicodin or Norco, codeine, which is in Tylenol 3 or 4, fentanyl has a lot of different brand names, duragesic or actique. This is the most concentrated form. This one is about a thousand times stronger than something like hydrocodone. Hydromorphone is dilated, meperidine is Demerol. They're all used for pain, they can all cause constipation, and they're all highly addictive. Okay, now coming into 20th century medicine, Alexander Fleming, he was a Scottish physician. He discovered penicillin by accident in 1928, and in 1938 came up with the first antibiotic from that. Gerhard Domack discovered the first synthetic drug, sulfonil, uh, sulfonamide, in 1932. This was used during World War II to treat wound infections. Now, before we had uh, sulfa drugs, as we called sulfonamides, sulfonamide was the first antibiotic basically it's an antibacterial um, anti-infective drug if we had a war any kind of a war more patients would die because their wounds became infected and they got gangrene that like the wound wouldn't kill them they would get shot in the arm or the leg and they could easily survive that but gangrene would set in and kill them so they had this is one reason why they had so many nurses um, like uh, like Florence Nightingale during the Crimean War, um, they needed nurses just to try and give them pain medication because they were dying of massive sepsis. And they and she, you know, advocated cleanliness, which really really helps, but doesn't always kill all the bacteria that set in during these wounds. Doctors would go from patient to patient without washing their hands. They would have blood all over their aprons, and they wouldn't even change their aprons. So when we came up with sulfa drugs, World War II was the very first war in which more patients died directly from their injuries than from infection that set in later. In all of human history, World War II was the first war where we could treat um, gunshot wounds, basically bayonet wounds, sword wounds, any kind of a wound like that. Okay, uh, this is a picture of Rosalind Franklin, PhD. Um, I just would have loved to have met her. She, um, people talk about her as if she was just a little chemistry assistant, but she was, she did have a PhD. When, and she worked with James Watson and Francis Crick, and they won a Nobel Prize for publishing the scientific paper on the structure of the DNA helix. And she had already passed away by the time this happened, but they didn't even mention her. Uh, and she's the one that did these X-ray crystallography. Now we don't know if working with X-rays caused her ovarian cancer that killed her. I believe it was ovarian, it was a, a cancer in that area. Um, but she noticed that double helix structure on her X-ray photographs and she really wanted better pictures before she did any publishing and other scientists that worked with her were faster in publishing. So she still contributed just as much as they did. Um, so she's one of my you know, female science heroes. Louis Pasteur, he was a French chemist and microbiologist, and he discovered an anthrax vaccine for animals. Anthrax is a bacterium that lives in soil. 
Now, if you concentrate it, you can make something that kills people if they breathe it. So several years ago, we had people mailing anthrax powder to famous you know, politicians, and some of them were found and jailed for that because it's, um, you know, it's a form of terrorism. But this vaccine is important for animals because most of the time this bacterium is harmless in the dirt, but in concentrated amounts, it can be very harmful. He also came up with pasteurization, which um, you know comes from his name, and he did some experimentation where he learned that if you take a broth, like beef broth, um, and you heat it and you keep it in a sealed container, microbes will not grow. But if you leave that container open, then microbes will grow in that container because it becomes contaminated. He did a whole lot of things. He lived a long time, you know, whereas Rosalind Franklin died in her 30s. Um, he had more time to do uh, things that he worked on. And then in your book on page 10, table 1-2, are examples of important vaccine advances in medicine. But Louis Pasteur, um, there he is in his workshop. This is not a photograph, but it's interesting and it kind of captures what he did look like. Before this, he was working on fermentation of beer. So one of his books is Studies on Fermentation, The Diseases of Beer, Their Causes, and the Means of Preventing Them. So I always think that's interesting. When we think of pasteurization, we think of pasteurized milk. We don't normally think of pasteurizing beer. Are some of these old remedies making a comeback? Um, we use, hemat we use uh, bloodletting to treat hematochromatosis. We use leeches to remove blood for skin grafts infection and maggots now also. You can Google um, and find an article on a dog that it was a show dog, you know, um, that had its toe almost cut off. And I don't remember if it got too close to a lawnmower. I don't remember what the, the deal was, but the vet wanted to amputate the toe. And the owner was like, no, this is a show dog and I won't ever be able to use him for stud if he's missing a toe. I'll have to explain why the toe is missing. And so they decided to try and reattach the toe. And in order to do so, they had to put a graft, they had to put a, um, like a rubber, um, it was almost like a rubber band that they attached to the dog, but it wasn't tight. And then they attached a certain number of maggots and they left them on for a certain length of time, like a few hours. Maggots are fly larva, okay? So that's why you see them on dead tissue all the time. They only eat dead tissue, they don't eat live tissue. So they're very good for removing dead tissue that could rot and cause infection. So this is one of the barriers to reattaching um, parts of the body is that it dies. And so if you have the maggots remove the dead tissue, the live tissue will reattach and live but you have to count them because they like to crawl inside. So they would have to count the maggots and then remove them with tweezers and count how many they removed. And you didn't want them to crawl anywhere else on the dog. So you had to put this little barrier of rubber on there. So it, it shows pictures. It's a fascinating article. Anyway, this was approved by the US Food and Drug Administration in 1976 and is very inexpensive. Um, there's a form of honey, it's called Manuka honey, and it's used today for its medicinal properties in wound healing. So you would almost like you would put um, triple antibiotic ointment, um, like Neosporin, they would use this sterile honey. And it is approved by the FDA in 2012 for sores that wouldn't heal, especially for patients that have diabetes. I thought that was interesting. Okay, uh, the early pharmacists were called apothecaries, and the apothecary referred to both the pharmacy and the pharmacist, and they sprung up after the Civil War. There were apothecaries back in England. In fact, there's a really book, uh, really good book by um, Candace, I can't remember her last name now, called The Apothecary Rose, and it was about a woman who married an apothecary, and when her husband died, she took over the apothecary because she had become his apprentice, and she kind of knew what he was doing. And then uh, she ends up falling in love with the king's archer, um, and then it becomes a mystery series after that, So, but uh, it was there's some really good books there. Um, so it's called Apothecary Rose, and 
it also talks about the guild system in York in uh, in I think it was 900 AD when this is set. So if you're interested in medieval history, that's you know it's it's not mostly not a romance, more of a mystery. And so we had apothecaries in the U.S. and especially after the Civil War, they became more popular. And they also built manufacturing plants for different drugs. People were trained to give medications accurately and pharmacists moved into the role of druggists. They were called druggists after that. The first pharmacy school was the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Sciences in 1821. And that's the one that has the really good museum of pharmacy in it. And you can go online and look at it. It's, they have a, you know, a virtual tour of the museum of pharmacy. In the 1800s, pharmacists compounded nearly every drug ordered by physicians. So if you remember the movie, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, and remember how young Jimmy works for the pharmacist, and he goes in and he tells the pharmacist that you can't give that to the patient because you used poison, and the pharmacist gets mad and slaps Jimmy, which I don't remember his name now, that wasn't his name in the movie. But anyway, he ends up deaf in one ear, and but he saved the pharmacist's career and later uh, when it you know what if i had never been born in that little second part of the movie where the angel comes down and says you've never been born so here's what happens and he finds the pharmacist as a drunkard outside the bar and nobody wants to help him it's because you know you weren't around to save him from poisoning that child so yes in the 1800s pharmacists compounded almost every drug ordered by physicians. They would take uh, bottles of powders down and they would mix them with different things and make capsules and make tablets and make liquid medications. Um, and now we can actually still do some compounding. I do some compounding at Children's Hospital. We do a lot of things where we make syrups out of powders or syrups out of pills. We will grind up the tablets and make a syrup out of it. There were things um, called cisterns that were large ornate jars that were used to store various herbs and ingredients. And um, we have medical recipe books to tell how to make these different medications. For instance, um, chalk uh, naturally can, it comes from calcium carbonate, so they would use it for heartburn. Rose petals could be used for a headache. So here's some pictures of these compounds. This right here, codeine, phosphate, phenobarb, and uh, ASA, ASA is acetyl salicylic acid. This is aspirin. Acetyl salicylic acid is aspirin. This compound is around today, but it's only in capsule form. And it's called, um, now I can't think of the brand name of it. Anyway, it's, uh, it's for uh, migraine headaches. So these are, uh, I took this picture at an antique store. You know, I love history. I love to go to antique stores and just look at old things. And so this was actually, these things were for sale at an antique store. And actually this particular book picture might be in your book, but I have a different one that looks very similar that I took at an antique store. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Early pharmacies or apothecaries would have a show globe hanging in the window. Um, this would tell people this is a pharmacy. And some towns would also let it know, let people going by, passersby know the status of the town. If the, if the liquid inside was red, there could be illness in the town and you should stay away. If the liquid was green, then the town was healthy. We don't have smallpox here today. You can come visit, stay in our inn, drink our liquor you know, that kind of thing. Tourists, welcome. Um, they would also use this to show how they had all this knowledge. They would actually, you know, mix two different colors. They would mix two clear ingredients and it would magically turn red because, you know, they know so much, they're so skilled. So anyway, early pharmacists played a minimal role in healthcare. From 1800 to 1900, the soda fountain became an extension of the town's drugstore. That in itself is a whole other history lesson because they came up with mineral water and phosphates, um, phosphosoda elixir. Um, and so they would make these sodas with bubbles in them, which is quite interesting. I don't know who would want to drink something with bubbles in it. 
Anyway, pharmacists or druggists sold soda and ice cream. They worked the lunch counter and they filled the day's 14 prescriptions. And the pharmacy setting promoted trust in the pharmacist. Um, if you ever watch any old Andy Griffith episodes, I think it's either season one or two, where Miss Ellie comes to town. And I can put a link to that episode on YouTube because it is, well, these days it's hilarious. But in those days, it was really very sweet how um, Miss Ellie took over Fred the pharmacist's drugstore. And she was a pharmacist. She had her... Um, PhD, which at the time was a general education in pharmacy. Um, and now, of course, pharmacists have to have the equivalent of a doctorate, but in those days they didn't, so quite interesting. The first U.S. pharmacy technicians were those enlisted in the military. So, yes, I had to get the complete Andy Griffith show. And normally, when we're in class, I would show that episode. It's so cute. I have to see which one it is. Oh, it's the complete first season. And it is season one, episode four. Ellie Comes to Town is the name of it. So, um, so anyway, the first pharmacy technicians were enlisted in the military and they were trained to fill prescriptions and do the job of a pharmacist. And to this day, military technicians have a broader scope of training and more authority and more responsibility than civilian technicians. Um, in fact, on ships, because we can now do these ship to shore videos, pharmacy technicians don't even have a pharmacist on the ship for the most part. They're able to fill things, show, you know, show the computer, show the camera, and then the pharmacist can sign it off from, you know, being on land. It doesn't have to be out on the out on the ocean. So naval um, military technicians or pharmacy technicians. They've consolidated all of their pharmacy tech training to the shepherd. Um, Shepherd Air Force Base, so it's through the Air Force, and so uh, I've met a lot of military pharmacy technicians that I work with now that once they live military life, they keep working as a technician, and they actually, they've told me that they, they were able to do more things than they can do here. Also, um, we had a lot of pharmacy clerks. Pharmacy clerks um, oftentimes were family members of the pharmacy owner and they worked behind the counters, they filled the stock, they ordered, they waited on customers, they would ring the product up. Before, in California, before 1992, we didn't have anything called a pharmacy technician. So when I first started working in pharmacy in 1988, um, I would go and get the medication for the patient, ring it up and say, oh, Oh, and this is your amoxicillin. You're supposed to take one capsule three times a day, take it with food, make sure you finish it all, and the patient would leave. If they had more technical questions than that, we would call the pharmacist over to answer the questions. When we get to chapter two, which we're not going to do next week, we're going to do it a few weeks later because it's a big chapter all about pharmacy law, we're going to talk about why I am no longer allowed to say any of that, which is fine with me, but it's interesting. So family members and uh, pharmacy clerks who were basically, you know, hired to work in the pharmacy, later they became pharmacy technicians. The 1960s brought a need for standardized training, not in California, but in other places. Professional pharmacy organizations became more involved in pharmacy technician training. States started issuing licenses or registration was another term they would use. The ASHP, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, finally started recognizing technicians in the 90s. Um, the Pharmacy Technician Certification Board in Washington, D.C. was created in 1995, and they came up with an exam so that you could become certified. Now, if you're in the pharmacy technology program, we highly recommend that you take that exam and we want you to take it because more and more pharmacies in California are requiring it. 1992 was when they started licensing technicians in California. I applied at the end of 92 and I became a technician in 93. The PTCB, that Pharmacy Technician Certification Board, they started coming up with educational standards and now our program at Valley College is nationally certified um, by the um, 
Okay, it's not going to just take me back to that one. But anyway, um, they came up with the PTCB came up with the National Pharmacy Technician Certification Exam. And then once you pass that, you will be a CPHT, which is a Certified Pharmacy Technician. Now, you pass that exam, every two years you have to renew it, you have to recertify. In order to recertify, you have to do 20 continuing education units or credits to recertify. And you have to, there's a lot of places you can find this continuing education. Um, some of my coworkers use PowerPack, that's another one. Um, there's free stuff out there so you don't have to pay for all of it. But anyway, more about that later. So now, pharmacy technicians can have more specialization. For instance, we can assist with anticoagulation monitoring. We can manage the automation and pharmacy coordination systems. When that um, AccuDose machine goes down, which is, it looks like a big chest of drawers, but if you open up the drawer, it's got little pockets in it with locked lids. Um, and so you basically log into the computer on top and you tell it what you want and the correct drawer will pop open and the lid will pop up and then you take the medication. If those machines don't work for the nurses, then they call us to run out there and try and fix it. And then I get on the phone with the company that made the, the drawer machine and they have to fix it for me. <laughs> we can manage medication and recon reconciliation programs. There's something called an antibiotic technician that monitors patients that are on antibiotic therapy. There's so many different things that we can do. In fact, um, recently um, we were given the go ahead all across the nation to um, actually administer vaccines because of COVID. So, you know, they aren't calling on us to do it yet, but we have permission now. I don't know, I've given my dog a shot, but I've never given other, you know, people a shot. So that would be interesting. Anyway, pharmacy technicians are in high demand now because pharmacists don't necessarily want to do the pill counting and the labeling that we do. Um, and pharmacists are assuming a lot more clinical roles, so they're delegating more of their traditional roles to technicians. Um, pharmacy requirements. In order to become a pharmacist, a doctor of pharmacy degree, the PharmD, is required in the U.S. Uh, that's usually four years of pharmacy school if the, if the student already has a bachelor's degree or all of their prerequisites, that, like they have to have chemistry, biochemistry, organic chemistry, um, microbiology, biology, they have to have a lot of science. So if you take all of those prerequisites, you have a bachelor's degree. You might as well just apply for it and get it. If you don't have that, then you have to do all the prerequisites. So most, most people that I know that are pharmacists had eight years of schooling after high school. Um, today's druggist needs in-depth and broad communication skills for dealing with both doctors on one side and patients on the other side. So they have to be able to talk to the doctor in medical terms and then turn around and talk to the patient in terms that are not real technical for the patient to understand. Now for pharmacy technicians, we need additional education and on-the-job training now in a lot of states. I think there's only a couple of states that don't um, have these requirements now. Okay, so some of the things that we do now, prepare medications, uh, compound specialty medications. In an inpatient pharmacy, we supply the floor stock, which is medication that's not for a specific patient, but it's kept near the nurses. We prepare IV medications. Um, it says transcribe doctor's orders. In California, we aren't allowed to write it down. We can read what the doctor write and type it into the computer, but most hospitals have pharmacists transcribing the doctor's orders. Uh, we fill patients' cassettes, which is now called cart fill, and it's basically um, all the medications that a patient in the hospital needs for 24 hours. Um, specialized technicians order drugs and supplies, or they work in a clinical setting, or they do quality control. We have an investigational drug technician that just works with the investigational pharmacist, and they do uh, studies on drugs. It's quite interesting. We have to have strong communication skills. We have to be able to um, talk to nurses, and we have to be able to talk to patients and their caregivers. 
and a lot of states te technicians can now administer vaccines. Pharmacists can also specialize in things like anticoagulation, pharmacokinetic services, oncology, which of course is chemotherapy and other forms of therapy for cancer, pediatrics, children, geriatrics, elderly people, and compounds. There was this very, uh, like a Gallup poll, okay, a Gallup poll, and they did a thing which basically said that pharmacy was the most trusted profession in America. I have, I have a little pin that says, pharmacy, America's most trusted profession for 150 years. I had that little pin. And then the very next year, <laughs> People started going through pharmacy trash behind the pharmacy and they started finding out information about their patients and eventually we came up with HIPAA laws um, because, you know, all of a sudden pharmacies weren't so trustworthy because we didn't think that people would go through our trash. It's trash. You're supposed to leave it alone. But anyway, um, now we have HIPAA laws, we have shredders, we have things that um, uh, encryption so that um, computer information that goes from one place to another online information is encrypted. So anyway, uh, we're still we're still up there. I think we're now up there in the top five. Um, pharmacists can be trusted to provide truthful information and be a confidant. People will tell their pharmacist things. They don't tell other people. I, I could tell you so many stories. One woman showed us, me and my other female technician and our male pharmacist, her mastectomy scars. And also another woman was showing us her Brazilian butt lift. And they're constantly saying, do you know what this rash is? And showing us their rash or lifting up their shirt and showing us their rash. You know, it just happens in outpatient pharmacy. Anyway, uh, clinical pharmacists work alongside doctors to provide medications and dosages. They work on prescribing. They do medications based on weight, and we're going to talk about that in math class. In community pharmacy, the pharmacists are now required by law to counsel patients. Technicians have to be trusted to provide the best care by filling the correct medication. Pharmacists are moving into a more highly clinical role, not just in counseling, but also working with medical staff. Uh, they do something called medication therapy management, where they look at all of the patient's medications, no matter where they got them, and they see if any of these things overlap or contradict each other, or contraindicate. Technicians are moving into transcribing orders, pulling medications, and filling prescriptions. We've done that for years. Technicians in specialized fields like Compounding can participate in a team approach to healthcare in the future and provide more specialized input. And pharmacists and technicians will always have different roles, but they both have a place in caring for patients. Okay, so if you sat through this whole thing, L, 53 minutes of it, thank you. Good job. If you have any questions, email me through Canvas.